Thank you, Eva. So thank you again to the workshop organizers for inviting me. Um, I'll talk about risk of selfish routing and most of the results that I'll present are with two wonderful collaborators. Uh, Thanasis Leonias was my postdoc uh, at UT Austin, now back in Greece, and Nikos Stier Moses, who is at Facebook. And this work uh, was motivated by um, questions like this. So um, I am driving between uh, Simons and let's say Palo Alto. Some of us in the audience, well, some of you in the audience maybe are doing this drive. And you want to know how long it will take so you can budget your uh, when to depart when, when you will arrive here. And um, <coughs> this is a snapshot that I did between the same source destination pair at noon, so about one hour. And then I tried it again at 4 p.m. on a given day. It, wa it increased to one and a half hours, roughly. And uh, one, so you see there is variability in travel times. So I don't need to convince anyone of that. Everyone has experienced it. But furthermore, you cannot even trust those predictions. Because when I did this commute a few weeks ago, I started, I departed Palo Alto at 4 PM. And at that time, I was told by Google it will, the journey will take me one hour. But by the time I reached near uh, Oakland somewhere, it was around 5 PM, so traffic conditions changed. And all of a sudden, this one hour turned to one and a half hours or more than that. So travel times are uncertain. And uh, you have to budget for that. So when you have a time sensitive destination uh, deadline type that you need to get to, so I don't like to be late for appointments, and I like to budget extra over the average travel time. Uh, and this here tells me on ev uh, how much extra people may need to budget for their trip. So this is um, a plot of the uh, travel time index and planning time index by the Texas Transportation Institute, which says let's have a unit here correspond to a, um, the duration of a trip. Um, the blue is the average travel time. So naturally, travel time increases during rush hour. But the red is how much extra I need to buffer to make sure I'm not late. So it gives me 95% chance of getting to my destination on time. And this red, the planning time index, how much I really need to budget for my trip, is more than twice the free flow time, how much I would drive if there were no congestion on the roads. So motivated by that, so me being risk averse because I like to be on time, uh, I need to make routing choices that take this uncertainty uh, into consideration. In particular, I may prefer maybe more roundabout routes that have longer expected travel time, but smaller variance, for example. There are many ways to trade off um, mean and variance and to incorporate uncertainty. But the, the goal of this work is to understand the effect of risk averse uh, driver behavior on the resulting traffic congestion uh, by studying the traffic assignment that results, um, in particular uh, uh, taking into account that uncertainty uh, will influence user decisions. Uh, so we want to understand what is the resulting equilibrium. So I postulate that when people select their individual uh, optimal routes that result into equilibrium, what are the properties of that equi equilibrium, and then we ask another question. Uh, we define this concept of price of risk aversion that I'll define more formally later. But basically, it's the price that society has to pay in increased overall travel time uh, when individuals make uh, risk averse routing decisions. Uh, so how do we understand traffic congestions? Uh, traffic congestion, there are multiple ways. One nice way, theoretically, to measure it uh, is uh, through this concept of price of energy that um, Eva gave a very nice introduction of uh, in the first talk today. Um, and price of energy is this uh, uh, quantification that measures the degradation of system performance due to selfish behavior of free will. Uh, specifically, it measures how much larger the cost of equilibrium is to the cost of social optimum, meaning if people make selfish routing decisions and they, the traffic pattern is an equilibrium one versus a central planner routes everyone, tells everyone which routes to take, so as to minimize the total travel time, that's the social uh, optimum cost. So how much larger uh, travel time would people experience if they make selfish routing decisions? 
And uh, by now, a classic result is that in uh, this price of energy for turns, in general graphs, if you have travel times that are linear functions of the traffic, uh, and there are other constants for uh, uh, more general uh, latency or travel time functions. So for thirds was the result due to uh, Rav Garden and Tardosh, and subsequently also a very nice uh, uh, proof given by Correa, Schultz, and Steer Moses. And just to show you why, where this four thirds comes from in a simple example, if you had a choice of two routes from S to T, and you had to route one unit of flow from S to T, so think of that as a, a thousand drivers, something like that, this one unit of flow would maybe split flow X on the top and flow one minus X on the bottom. Uh, so X is something between zero and one. And let's say that we model the congestion effect, the travel times as a function of traffic by saying that the travel time on top is X. So the more people choose the top route, the more each uh, of them will travel. Uh, whereas on the bottom, it's constant. It's always one hour. So what would be the equilibrium traffic pattern in this very simple example? It will be for every single driver, every single unit of this one unit, of every single particle of this one unit of flow will choose to go on top because x is always less than or equal to 1. And so everyone will experience uh, less than or equal travel time going on top. So the equilibrium will route the entire unit of, t of traffic on the top with uh, which results in everyone traveling one hour, and the total travel time is one hour. However, if you were a central planner and wanted to minimize the total travel time, it's a very simple derivation uh, uh, to see that you would actually want to split the traffic in, in half and tell half of the drivers to route on the top and half of the drivers to route on the bottom because under this traffic allocation, the half drivers on top will each experience half hour of travel time. The ones on the bottom will experience one hour. One hour. So the average of those, or the, again, the total travel time, will be three over four. So this is less. And this is the social optimum traffic assignment. Again, it's a very simple derivation that, that you can do. Uh, and therefore, the price of energy, which remember is the equilibrium cost divided by the social optimum cost, one divided by three quarters is four over three. And so amazingly, we see already the worst case in this very simple example, but this worst case four over three holds for completely general networks. Um, so uh, however, as I mentioned, travel time is uncertain. So people will want to take into account this uncertainty and if they make risk averse routing decisions, the main message here is that this may result in a very different price of energy. In particular, we took in an earlier work with Giorgio Spiliuros and Jeff Shama, we considered the particular model of uncertainty, uh, and our goal was really to understand different risk averse profiles, so different models of risk averse objectives uh, given by these different names. What was the resulting price of energy under, again, linear uh, delay functions? And you see that the price of energy can vary widely between four thirds and unbounded infinity. So if you want to understand the effect of um, uh, selfishness and risk aversion on top of it on the resulting traffic pattern, risk, the model of risk critically affects that, that prediction and it really needs to be taken into account to better understand um, the system performance. Uh, let me play some of the work in, in context of routing games, which is uh, the model that I'm uh, uh, using here, have been studied for a long time, both without uncertainty and with uncertainty. Although uh, uh, looking from this angle of risk averse uh, uh, routing behavior is a fairly new trend with uh, still a few but now growing uh, set of uh, uh, papers. Um, and I'll present, uh, I'll zoom into one particular model that we considered. So we have a directed graph, and uh, let's say we have a unit source and destination pair that everyone wants to go from S to T. Uh, and we consider a, a non-atomic player. This is the jargon for a flow model. Each 
each player is infinitesimally small, so a change in an individual player's route does not affect traffic conditions that the others uh, see. And so the question is how to route that uh, flow through, through the network, the different uh, feasible ST paths. Uh, we can encode the resulting routing choices in a vector. So this is just a, a vector over all possible ST paths. And each coordinate here corresponds to a path which tells you how many users chose that particular route. Uh, so we want to capture two things, the congestion effect and the uncertainty. Uh, the congestion effect is captured in the traditional way. So this is, uh, the, think of that as the travel time or delay function or latency function as a function of xc, the flow on edge e, or how many users go on edge e. And this here is some noise. That's how we model the uh, uncertainty. And now the question is how do players route given this uncertain travel times on edges? There are many ways to model risk aversion, but for this model, we motivated by the picture that I showed you initially, the planning time index where you, you have to add buffer to your average travel time. What buffer could we add? Some natural choices are uh, standard deviation of the travel time on your route or, or the variance. There, there are pros and cons uh, with both, and I am happy to discuss those later. But for now, let's say this makes uh, uh, is perhaps more, more sensible because mean and standard deviation are measured in the same time units. Mean and variance, some people frown it, but let's say that we wanted to study that also because it's mathematically a more convenient model. If you assume, and we do assume, independent travel times on each edge, then the variance of a path is simply the sum of variances of edges uh, along that path so that the, the cost of a path, the mean variance cost, uh, uh, nicely decomposes into a sum of costs over the edges. So we consider those two uh, risk averse functions in this particular model. And uh, we wanted to understand the, uh, equilibrium. So how do I define equilibrium uh, formally? So again, remember that users want to select minimum risk paths uh, where uh, Minimum by minimum risk, I mean in this case the mean standard deviation or the mean variance of a path. And we say that the flow, a resulting traffic pattern, is an equilibrium whenever users route along the shortest or minimum risk paths. And we will call this a risk averse, I'll call this a risk averse equilibrium when the when they minimize the the travel the the minimum risk of a path given by the mean standard deviation or uh, or mean variance and i will at some point later want to contrast this with the risk neutral uh, neutral equilibrium where uh, drivers don't care about the variability so they simply want to minimize the expected travel time i want to ask this question you're assuming that people trade off Expected delay and variance, everyone trades off the same way. Excellent question, and I'll revisit that at the very end. But yes, I do assume that here. So the way they trade it off is with this coefficient r. Um, this is how much importance they attribute to the additional buffer that they give. And so a risk neutral person would set r equal to zero. So that means that they simply want to minimize the average travel time. So here, this L is really the average travel time. Uh, whereas more and more risk averse people will have higher and higher R's. They'll have larger and larger buffers that they add. So yes, here everyone is homogeneous. Everyone has the same R. And I'll call this R the risk averse parameter. So uh, here is in our initial investigation, here is what we uh, saw. Uh, the whether equilibrium exists or doesn't really depends on the specifics of the model. In particular, if this uncertainty depends on, on the flow or doesn't, and whether the model is non-atomic or atomic, meaning here every individual is infinitesimally small, so it's a flow model. This is a discrete model where a user is big enough so that a single user change in route uh, affects travel times that other users see. So in all these cases, we have a, a different type of equilibrium, uh, one that either solves a convex program but exponentially large or a potential game, 
in these cases, we don't even know how to compute equilibrium, and, and sometimes equilibrium does not exist. And focusing on this column here, when the uncertainty does not depend on the flow in the network, we were able to show that the price of energy uh, with risk averse uh, users is the same as the price of energy in the corresponding deterministic game in the classic model. Uh, yeah. Uh, that's another excellent question. In this theorem, we measure, so until now I didn't really talk about social welfare. That was all about equilibrium. This is the first time this comes up. And in, in this theorem, social welfare is the sum of user costs. That will be the sum of the mean. I'm sorry? User cost is a random quantity, right? Because there is the, the, this random effect. Uh, so the. So I measure it as the, the mean and standard deviation are not random, right? The, the travel time they experience may be random, but they make their choice based on the mean and standard deviation or mean and variance. And I take the summation over this mean variance path costs. And this is the social uh, welfare in this case. But I'll change in the next slide. OK. Um, and so here, when we show this theorem, we realize that this theorem doesn't give us much insight into how much exactly of the price of energy is attributed to selfish behavior, how much of it is attributed to risk aversion. So we couldn't really understand the effect of risk aversion in itself, which is why we changed from price of energy type analysis to a, a different one that I'll define next in order to decouple those two effects of selfishness and risk aversion. So here is where I change the definition of, of social welfare. Um, so we define this concept of, of price of risk aversion, which is um, informally how much more users travel, uh, how much more society pays in increased total travel time due to risk averse routing choices. Um, and this is the ratio of the cost of a risk averse equilibrium to the cost of a risk neutral equilibrium. And by cost here, I only consider the sum of expected travel times. So now I have ignored the, this extra buffer that individuals uh, added for their uh, risk, uh, for their routing choice in the, um, in the social cost. One way to think of it is that the central planner is uh, perhaps risk neutral, cares about long-term averages, and this is what they want to minimize. Um, and so they will, will measure the cost of any flow now uh, as just the sum of expected travel times, the, the first term in that uh, mean, mean variance cost. And from here on for the next few slides, I will just think of risk aversion as the mean variance objective function. So users want to minimize the mean plus variance of a path. And again, another uh, um, motivation for, for this cost is that we somehow want to have the same benchmark for those two equilibria. If we had uh, 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 the variance term included here, but not here, it's like comparing apples and oranges, so that wouldn't be very meaningful. Uh, and so really, uh, the question is, in expectation, how much more risk averse users travel uh, compared to risk neutral users? So we want to understand uh, how, uh, how much more risk averse users travel. And again, to give, a, uh, to give an insight, let's revisit that example I showed before, but now with uh, uncertainty and variance in incorporated. So again, we want to send one unit of flow that would split, let's say, x on top and one minus x on the bottom. And now those two links are characterized by mean and variance pairs given uh, as follows. So here, the mean is, uh, here, the mean and variance are constant. One is some k. And on top, we use this k. So we say the mean is 1 plus rk times x uh, and zero variance. So risk averse users, risk averse users don't like the variance here. And one can see that if, uh, if a user, if a risk averse user wanted to minimize 1 plus r, remember r was my risk averse coefficient. So if I wanted to minimize 1 plus rk, so 
So I compare 1 plus rk on the bottom and 1 plus rk times x on the top, but x is less than or equal to 1. So all the risk averse users go on the link with no variance, intuitively. Uh, 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 it and so the cost of the experience, x becomes 1 on top. So all of them will experience an average cost of 1 plus rk. Risk neutral users, on the other hand, do not care about the variance term. They only seek to minimize the mean. And in a risk neutral equilibrium, the flow will be such that both the top and the bottom will have mean 1. And so all of them will experience travel cost of 1. So we see that the risk averse uh, uh, users will travel that much more in equilibrium than the risk neutral one. So price of risk aversion, the ratio of these two, is 1 plus rk. And again, a reminder, r was my coefficient of risk aversion. And k here was just some arbitrary constant that I said my variance would be. So this is now bad news because if I set in this example k to be very, very large, that means that risk averse users would may travel infinitely more time than risk neutral users. And it's not a, somehow a very meaningful result. But it is, um, in practice, we could argue that the variance is not arbitrarily larger than, than the mean. And so if we consider bounded variance to mean ratios, and this k will give me this bound, then we want to compute the price of risk aversion for this fixed k. And this is what I'm going to do. So again, remember, if I don't fix k, it, the answer will be infinity, not, not very meaningful and doesn't give much insight. But when I fix k, how much more the variance can be relative to the mean, then uh, we studied how this price of risk aversion changes as a function of topology and also as a function of edge delay. And the result that we obtained was that in a general graph, the price of risk aversion depends on a topology parameter. So remember that in the simple two-link example that I showed you, it was 1 plus rk. And in general, it is 1 plus rk times some eta, where eta is, is a parameter of the topology of the network, which is... Um, Something that we don't understand very well is the in a in a alternating path. That's a path that may have forward and backward edges, and it will be the number of forward subpaths. How many such forward subpaths we have? So, in particular, for um, series parallel networks we would have that this eta is 1. So the price of risk aversion is 1 plus rk, the same as what we saw on the simple example of two parallel links. On the brace graph, an alternating path, such as this one over here, has uh, two alternations. And so eta is 2. And on more complicated networks, eta can be as large as half of the number of vertices, because you could have a path which alternates going through every possible vertex and changes direction uh, at every vertex. And so this seems like a very bad quantity, um, right? The number of nodes in the graph uh, 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 coming in this price of risk averse bound. Uh, well, we show that this bound is tight. Um, before I go to the tightness, this is a brief intuition of how we show the, uh, the result. So in a general graph, the proof idea is, first of all, to show that there is a, a specific alternating path that alternates between forward and backward edges, so which, which has a very specific property. The property that the forward edges have more risk neutral flow, risk neutral equilibrium flow, whereas the backward edges have more risk averse equilibrium flow. And once we show the existence of such a path, and then comparing the two equilibria, the risk averse and the risk neutral equilibria, uh, um, then suffices to compare each of them individually to that alternating path and knowing the direction um, um, of which, which flow is higher, risk averse or risk neutral, uh, we, can, we can derive the bound. So this is the main insight in the proof. Um, and now we show that this bound is tight by 
uh, inductively defining a, a series of, of graphs, so a family of graphs, starting from the brace graph here, um, and showing that for this graph, there exist appropriate uh, latency functions which, uh, which attain that worst case bound. And then for graphs of bigger and bigger size, we basically take the graph in the previous stage and put two copies of that graph and then connect the two copies in a brace-like manner. Uh, and so then we take this next graph, put two copies of that graph and connect them together in a, in a brace-like manner. So anyway, so, so this is the really the uh, uh, tight bound. And again, to recap, this price of risk aversion, which was simply the ratio of the cost of a risk averse equilibrium to risk neutral equilibrium, is one plus eta rk, where eta is this topology parameter, r is the coefficient of risk aversion, and k was the variance to mean uh, ratio. Um, we were also subsequently able to show a bound which is closer in spirit with the traditional price of energy uh, bounds, uh, which is not with respect to the network topology, but with respect to the latency function classes. And so uh, basically, we can eliminate this set of parameter, but then we will need to multiply by the corresponding price of energy in the game with the, without any uncertainty. So it, uh, these results, again, were for the very specific risk attitude where every user wanted to minimize the mean plus variance of travel time. Um, and it's open to extend. Uh, we've been trying to extend this to mean plus standard deviation, but the standard deviation uh, is mathematically so much more complicated that it's, it's been a nightmare to work with. So in any case, it's open to extend this type of bound to other risk attitudes. But now I want to revisit the question of what happens when this risk averse coefficient is actually different among different users. Um, we asked uh, uh, a question motivated by this risk averse routing, but it really can be phrased in a, in a more general way. So if users have to trade off two cost functions, uh, for example, delay and money they have to pay in calls, or again, mean and variance, and so on. So they have two criteria for each edge. And they have this, uh, what I called before the risk averse parameter, this trade-off parameter between those two uh, criteria that they care about. What if uh, this parameter, this trade-off parameter of the two criteria is different among different users? So maybe there is a class of users i that have alpha i, another class of users with a different alpha, and so on. We wondered whether, um, well, uh, how much uh, heterogeneity or diversity of user preferences would help reduce the cost of equilibrium, where again, the cost of equilibrium is uh, uh, it's the sum of just this criterion, uh, the same as before. And so we showed, maybe to our surprise, somehow we wanted to, to prove uh, uh, consistent with the general idea that diversity helps that somehow diversity always helps. But it turned out that it only helps in certain networks. So we show that diversity al always helps if and only if the network is here is parallel. And basically here is parallel is a network that does not contain uh, this, this graph, that base graph. So it's somehow a limited class of graphs. In all the other graphs, we have counterexamples where diversity can actually hurt and the cost of equilibrium increases. And this is for a single origin destination pair. For multiple origin destinations, we uh, show that this generalizes to uh, a type of networks that we call block matching networks, which is, you can think of somehow as an extension of here is parallel for multiple source destination pairs. And just to summarize, so the general goal of my research has been to develop a, a toolkit of both algorithms and, and game theory techniques that uh, enable uh, our understanding and uh, of how to do risk mitigation in networks. And uh, I've touched on just a few problems, but there are many open problems in, in all these uh, areas, algorithms, game theory, and mechanism design, with uh, 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 a lot of opportunities for impact in uh, transportation and other applications, the smart grid, communications, and so on. Thank you very much.
said that the situation with unbounded variance is not meaningful. But it, isn't it the case that that just corresponds to unbounded uncertainty about which routes are going to take longer or quicker? Um, so the unboundedness is relative to the average on that particular route. So what I said is if you give, in fact, not an, even an entire route, one link, yeah. and for this link you measure the average travel time and then the variance of this travel time, I said that in practice it may make sense to say that the variance is not much larger than, than the average. And now you say, well, maybe... In the old days before we had phones with maps, we were in a situation of almost total ignorance about which route. So the uncertainty was then unbounded. But then that's a different situation that I cannot really address with this model because here I assume that I, I know the mean and variance. And so somehow I assume that I have uh, data that gives me uh, what variance is because if I did not know variance, I couldn't do any of this optimization. What, what I'm trying to figure out is it sounds as if there's, there's some, um, quanti some uh, variance which maximizes the price of risk aversion. I mean, if the variance is zero, if you have perfect knowledge about how long it's going to take on all routes, then the price of risk aversion is also zero. And One in the way I define, but yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, on the other hand, if you're totally ignorant of, of traffic conditions, then you may as well choose a, a route at random, in which case there's also no price for risk aversion. Everyone would choose at random, uh, which implies that somewhere in between, there, there must be a point that maximizes this price. No, I'm not sure. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's an interesting question, but I'll just, I'll just remark that the price of risk aversion does not inform users individual users how to choose their route. So yes. it's not okay. that yeah. unbounded price of risk version means that I should choose my route at random. Okay. Although that maybe we should take this offline. <laughs> maybe we should take yeah. this offline and yeah. thank Abby. Thank you.